All right, so we're gonna let everybody in the room here. So just give us a few seconds, everybody, as we get going and uh, we're making sure we're streaming live on Facebook as well. So we'll just hold for a moment here while we get going. All right, hey everybody, this is Jeff Martin with Magic City Books. So thankful to have you guys all joining us tonight. This is our weekly virtual author event series that we've been doing for the past several months. We've been mostly doing Monday and Thursday evenings um, with occasional ones scattered throughout, but we've been really trying to give you guys something to put on your calendar, have something to look forward to, something that's regularly scheduled that you can count on. Um, so these uh, Mondays and Thursday nights have been a lot of fun. Um, we have a couple of things coming up I wanted just to mention to you. Um, we're going to be doing a pretty big event on September 8th with an author you may have heard of named Margaret Atwood, uh, who's going to be uh, joining us to talk about her long-awaited and uh, best-selling sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, uh, The Testaments. So she's doing a very small virtual tour, so I'm going to be interviewing her for that. That is a ticketed event. Uh, tickets are moving pretty quickly. So if you'll go to our website, magiccitybooks.com, you can get your ticket for that. It includes a signed book from uh, Margaret Atwood as well. So that's going to be a really special night. Um, but then a couple of other things coming up. Uh, I think one especially that um, I'm really excited about is um, on August 30th, we're going to be doing an event with uh, Hannibal Johnson for his new book, Black Wall Street 100, which is uh, looking toward the centennial of the Tulsa race. So a really important conversation. He's been working on this book for quite some time and looking at, um, at ways to kind of find out new information about that horrific event and uh, kind of get us ready for uh, this 100th year commemoration coming up. So that's going to be on an afternoon on Sunday, August 30th at 2 p.m. So that's free and open to everybody. And you can go to our website for details. And we have tons of other stuff coming up that you can uh, see on there as well. I won't go through the whole list. Um, tonight, you know, one of the things we've been really happy to do this summer and over these past few months is to you know, talk about things that are going on in our world, talk about things that are happening, uh, current events, uh, issues that you may be grappling with or, or thinking about. And so when we had the opportunity to do an event with Sarah Chase um, for her really thought provoking book on corruption in America, we didn't want to turn that opportunity down. Uh, Sarah has had a pretty amazing uh, career with all kinds of different facets from being a reporter for National Public Radio to serving as a special assistant for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to all kinds of other achievements and accolades and is really kind of uh, one of our leading experts on the concept of corruption and what that means. And of course, that's uh, something that we're hearing about a lot these days. So we're going to talk about this wonderful new book. Uh, what's been going on recently, um, and much, much more. So I want to say a big welcome to Sarah, who's joining us from rural West Virginia. Hello, Sarah. Hello, and hello, everyone. We were just, Jeff and I were speaking before we all came on about how much we all regret not being in a room with you folks so we can actually connect with you, um, which is so meaningful to, you know, to us. And we are so appreciative, you know, that you all have way too much to do. You're juggling too many things and that you take some time out to spend an evening with us. We really, we really appreciate it. And I will say, um, for those of you who would like to get a copy of this book, we will be posting links in our chat here throughout the evening. Um, occasionally, just to remind you where to get that, I would encourage you to do so. And also, if you have questions while we are talking, please put those in our Q&A here and I will uh, put those into our conversation while we're going. So uh, I'm sure you'll have some questions popping up. Uh, so Sarah, I guess I'd like to begin at a kind of a large scope and just kind of one, talk to you about how did you kind of get into the work of looking at and being interested in the concept of corruption? And secondly, what is corruption? I think it's a word that has a lot of weight to it, but you know, what does that actually mean? So I never had any intention of working on corruption. 
9-11 happened. I went galloping off to Afghanistan to cover the fall of the Taliban government for National Public Radio and decided, you know, this is a really important place at this moment. And so I bailed um, and decided to work for a while helping rebuild this country that had, in a way, I want to say, um, it, it was almost an innocent bystander, right? Um, to these momentous events. And so it was a regular reconstruction thing. I was rebuilding villages and, you know, things like that. And then as time went on, about two, three years into it, um, people, I learned Pashto, and I was about the only American that Afghans could speak to, right? Because I lived in downtown Kandahar and I could speak their language and there's no intermediary. And they started telling me about the corruption of their government and how they were getting shaken down every time they interacted with a government official. And what was troubling them was it seemed to them that the American presence in Afghanistan was actually reinforcing and enabling the corruption of the, of the government that we, were, that we Americans were supporting. And they couldn't figure that out because they were actually very, um, they were delighted actually initially to have us there um, because they wanted a government that functioned in the public interest. So that was a really interesting thing for me because the, you know, the cliche about Afghanistan is, uh, oh, these people just don't want to be governed, you know, democracy, it's not, for, it's not for everyone, it's not for them. I was like, wow, their villages are run democratically. Um, they know exactly what democracy is and they know what a government owes its citizens. And so I was pushed into working on corruption by my Afghan neighbors. <laughs> it wasn't like me going there with some Western mindset. It was the Afghans that forced me to focus on the topic. And given where I was, and, and I'm just going to apologize for a second here. I was telling again, Jeff, earlier, it's evening and we have no CMs here in West Virginia, which are these tiny, tiny little biting insects, and I'm getting eaten alive. So if I'm scratching, it's not that I haven't taken a bath. <laughs> it's because of the no CMs. Please forgive me. Um, so uh, in that context, I'm in downtown Kandahar, which is the heartland of the Taliban, in the middle of a, what quickly started to be a reigniting insurgency. And what was driving people back into the arms of the Taliban was not some, I mean, here I was an American. I had friends all through town. The issue was not American culture. It wasn't Western culture. It wasn't religion. It was corruption. And that really blew my mind because again, that ran counter to everything you heard about extremist movements. So I wrote a book that came out in 2015 called Thieves of State, Why Corruption Threatens Global Security, which looked not only at Afghanistan, but then from there I went to a number of other systemically corrupt countries and discovered that there were violent insurgencies. I mean, Nigeria, Uzbekistan, there were revolutions happening across the Arab world. When you scratch the surface of those, it was about corruption. I suddenly realized this issue was not just an Afghan weirdness, you know, that was specific to that, you know, kind of remarkable country that's Afghanistan. This was a global phenomenon. And in that book, I finished it with an epilogue that basically said, guys, it's not just countries like Tunisia and Egypt and Bahrain and Uzbekistan and Nigeria and Afghanistan. It's us. We're on this continuum. And if we're not careful, it's going to blow up in our face. Now, I didn't expect that it would blow up in our faces so quickly. But frankly, that's really the spin I put on the election of 2016, mm -hmm. which both on the left, if you will, and on the right, if those words even mean anything anymore, um, we had maverick politicians that absolutely blew up the political race. I mean, big surprise on both sides, and both of them were emphasizing corruption. So, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, I think in our minds, when we think of this kind of popular consciousness, and we think about corruption, 
uh, in America, we have a few touch points, I think, historically. We think about, of course, Watergate. We think, of course, of maybe like Boss Tweed and kind of the, the machine, the democratic machine of New York. But there's kind of like those five or six things that we, I think, think of as those touch points when we kind of have that notion. Um, you look much further back and kind of think about this concept beyond that. Can you kind of talk about the role that corruption has played in kind of forming, you know, Western democracy generally and, you know, how, 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 how you kind of looked to the past to kind of talk about the present? Yeah, um, actually, I go even further back than that. Um, and that's one of the, I would say, kind of different things about this book than, you know, there's a lot being written about corruption in the United States at the moment. It tends to take a very current and rather partisan approach, which I don't, either of those. I actually start the book, there's a prologue that happens in 2016, but the first full chapter starts at 600 BC. And why is that? It's because that's when money was invented. But not only that, I feel, you know, the word myth is used these days basically to mean something that's not true. Um, and, um, but myth is one of the deepest and most insightful kinds of literature, if you will, for humans explaining themselves to themselves. I mean, there's so much insight in myth. And sometimes I feel like because we've ignored that storehouse of wisdom, we're being forced to live our myths in real life, you know? So I go back to the myth of Midas. Midas, remember that guy? The one who every, he, he the god asked, he offered him one single wish. And Midas said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. And the god was upset about that. And you know what? Midas was upset too within about 30 seconds. Because once he got that gift, he found that everything he touched turned to gold. That means that everything that had any value to him, including his food and drink, water, apples, everything that was beautiful and irreplaceable, Hawthorne wrote a kids version of it with a daughter for Midas. You know, I'm hesitating also because I'm looking very dark. I'm not seeing myself much, but do I look so dark that you can hardly see me? Because I can turn I can on. see I can see you okay. All right. Yeah. I could turn a light on. Just while we're being friendly here. It might not hurt. Might not hurt. I think that's a little bit better. I apologize everybody. We're all getting used to this. I think that's fine. That's good. Um so, but they, it was distracting me, actually. <laughs> um, so, the point there is, it, well, and what I found that was fascinating is there was a Midas, and he lived just about where and when money was invented. So that myth is actually about money, which was a revolutionary new way of storing and transferring value. And what's different about it is when you get addicted to money, which you could call the Midas disease, when you catch the Midas disease, which means that you want money more than anything else, uh, first of all, you convert everything of real value to, frankly, worthless metal. What can you do with gold? You can't even make a sword out of gold. You know, In this day and age, it's zeros in bank accounts. And the problem is that once that becomes the measure of social standing, how many zeros you have in your bank account, once your society is basically run by the Midas disease, then it's a race with no finish line. And that is such a terrifying fact because we do live on a finite planet. And people with the Midas disease are going to convert everything of value on this planet and everything of value that humans are, produce, and do into zeros in bank accounts. So then you asked me to talk historically, and you also asked me to talk about the definition of corruption. Corruption, you know, it's the abuse of public trust for private gain. Um, it, the legal definition has been deliberately narrowed 
for at least the last 20 to 30 years in this country. It's, it, it, and, and On Corruption America talks about that process. So it gets very confusing in the United States where we ordinary people can smell and feel corruption when we see it. You know, like it, it walks like a duck, right? But the definition has become so narrow that it's almost impossible to now convict anyone for the crime of corruption. Um, but even that's not sufficient, because even today, where it's much in the news, we sort of get this feeling that it's a collection of venal acts of self-dealing by a bunch of different people, right? I mean, the stories tend to be um, separate, divided, isolated. Often they're investigative stories, so they get into a welter of detail that after a while kind of frankly even bores me. Corruption as like that, as something that individuals do, that has always existed, or at least since there's been government. People have abused their, their positions of power for personal gain. What's different and scary is when this principle is actually governing society. And and the last time that really happened on a widespread scale in the United States was in the late 19th and early 20th century. So you mentioned Boss Tweed. That's right in that period. And it was up and down the political system. It was the city bosses, but it was also, you know, the Ulysses S. Grant administration was riddled with corruption. Um, the railroads were the most unbelievably corrupt uh, enterprises. I mean, and a lot of this I had to learn. I'm not, I'm a historian, but I'm not a 19th century historian by, by training. And so a lot of this was news to me. And what I discovered was, you know, similar to what we're experiencing today, corruption was the work of intertwined, if you will, social networks, right? people who went to school together, who had worked together, who were friends with each other, who came from the same city or whatever, who did each other favors. And this, and this network is reinforced by the exchange of favors, by switching personnel from business to government, back to business, back to government, so that in effect, the network runs both business and government. And government no longer serves the public interest it is bent and distorted and, and uh, sometimes broken. Some of the institutions are actually broken in order that the government will serve the network and not the people. And that's what we experienced in the 19th century. And I was really struck by the similarities to today. You know, when you think about concepts like uh, cronyism and nepotism, and things like that. Do you view those as just branches on the tree of corruption? These are just kind of other terms that we use and concepts. Yeah, yeah, to yeah absolutely. Corruption. Because that's how the network functions is by when you say nepotism and cronyism, that's how you keep power and money inside the network is you bestow office or position or contract or you name it on your friends and family, right? And so these networks, and I've looked at them in a dozen countries around the world, and it is remarkable how parallel, you know, the functioning is. And that's really what on corruption was or is, is my, you know, I was an internationalist. I'd spent all my time galloping around, you know, places like Egypt and Tunisia and, and Honduras and whatnot. And I had discovered these patterns. And then I said, uh oh, it's time. It's time to apply the same exact methodology and approach that I've used in countries that I don't know, you know, in countries that may seem alien to us. In a way, almost clinically, I need to apply the same approach to my own country. And I was pretty distressed at what I found. Um, and and so what I what I wanted to say is that you talk about cronyism and nepotism. In some countries that I've looked at, these networks are much more tightly, you know, woven. And they're typically woven around a family core. In almost every country I've ever seen, there's a tight family core. Now, in some countries, that really family core really runs the whole thing. 
In other countries, it's looser. There might be rival networks who are allied sometimes and then compete with each other other times, and it's a little bit more turbulent. In some countries, the, if you will, the public sector is kind of in the lead, so the president or whatever of the country is kind of running the show. In a country like Moldova or some of the other post-Soviet countries where we talk about oligarchs, what that really means is that the integrated network is being led from the private sector, not the public sector. But it's not like you've got these independent oligarchs that are all doing their own thing. No, they're bound together. And, and so I, I reach for another myth as a metaphor for these networks, which is the myth of the Hydra, which is that Greek monster. Multi-headed monster. Yeah. Exactly. So one point about the Hydra is that, you know, if you just look at the heads, you think it's whatever, nine or a hundred, depending on the, you know, on, the, on the story you're reading, different animals, right? It looks like nine different snakes. But if you stand back, and they're all striking and, and moving and doing their own thing, right? So you could think it's nine separate things. But if you stand back, you see all of those heads are attached to a single body. And so those heads all doing their separate things are working to advance the interests of the whole. And that's how these networks function. Um, I was thinking, you know, one of the things that really struck me about the book, and you know, it made me think about some big ideas, which is what I love about books like this. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a presidential election, and especially in the primaries, in every, every election we've ever had pretty much in my lifetime, there's always been talk of getting back to a thriving middle class, which existed in the post-war era, but really only really existed from about 1950 to about 1980, and probably even ended before that. But really then, so it's like a, a pretty much a blip on the American radar, but every politician, especially on the Democratic side, talks about returning to this period. My question to you is, especially in light of corruption, when you have a capitalist system like we do, and then you have the American dream over here, is the natural default of our system wealth inequality like that? And is a, is a moment like that post-war middle class something that was an anomaly because of the conditions and it's not really a place we could easily get back to? It's a great question. And it's, I mean, I don't quite frame it that way in non-corruption in America, but I address basically what you're talking about. I mean, any system, capitalist, communist, you know, you name it, is a fiction. It's something, it's a set of rules that is created by human beings for human beings. So it really depends on what rules we make and enforce, right? So during the Gilded Age, and I use I mean, I use the term Gilded Age for a slightly longer period, but it's really the period prior to the one you're talking about when systemic corruption, when people diseased with the Midas disease had captured our country um, and were rigging the system because that's what they do. So you got systemic corruption. Um, and what they were doing was writing and enforcing the rules to their own benefit. And that's why you had massive wealth inequality. You had massive um, exploitation of labor. You had the effectively the re-enslavement of African-Americans. Now we're talking from approximately 1870 70 until, I put the change a little earlier than you do. I would say the change starts in the late 1930s. So for that period, the rules were written by kleptocratic networks, right? So no wonder we had wealth inequality. That's not the definition of capitalism. That's a specific version of capitalism, which was um, engineered by a tiny coalition of people diseased, you know, people sick, wasted with the Midas disease, right? Then what? So what happened? What I was really interested in is once I found how parallel that situation was to today, then I said, okay, well, how did they get out of it? Because there was this interwar period that you're talking about. So my question was, how did we get to that? And could we today learn some lessons from our forebears? So 
one thing I learned about was the incredible, persistent, courageous, creative, festive, sometimes violent, determined protest movements that stretched throughout that period. And it was a real education. I looked at three. I mean, this book, again, is not meant to be a compend an exhaustive compendium of everything in all periods, right? I'm looking to make it a kind to provide readers with a sort of framework that they can then apply to the welter of news that's like snow on us under every day and be able to understand what's happening to us. And so similarly, I didn't go through every single reform movement there was in that period, but I looked at the labor union, the not only union, but the, the kind of labor tro protest movement. First of all, one really interesting thing, the eight hour day was a really important aspect. Now, I don't know what the law is in Oklahoma. Where I live, all my neighbors are working 12 hour shifts again. Yeah, Oklahoma is a right to work state, yep. so yeah. Yep. yep, and the eight hour day was one of the most important and central fights of that period. And what I found really interesting was, it wasn't just about rest, it was about being a human. It was about time to read, time to educate yourself, time to smell the flowers. Literally, that was one of the anthems, you know? And I really appreciated that. It's about what, how do we need to organize our lives to be well-rounded human beings? So that was an incredible movement. They got viciously, violently stamped down again and again and again and again, um, much more violently than in Europe, for example. Another one I looked at was, and these all overlap, right? So there were some pretty creative political movements, and there was a farmers alliance in Oklahoma, among other places, you know, and in, in uh, West Texas, that whole belt of what was the West at the time, you know, and you know better than I do what, how far flung people's homesteads were and things like that. So that is also a real object lesson for us. They didn't need Zoom, right? They were getting together in their covered wagons and in schoolhouses, and they had traveling lectures, and it was a huge civic education process. These folks, and the issue was um, crop lean farming, which I'm sure a lot of people you know, know about or their grandparents know about, you know? And um, it was impossible. It was impossible to make a living. And so they were trying to figure out how do you, how do you get around the company store, not the company store, but the local, the one local store that was extending the so-called credit. And so they were coming up with all these ways of trying to put their orders, their input orders together uh, to buy collectively and then sell their produce, uh, you know, their crop collectively and things like that. They came up with some really critical and sophisticated reforms like direct election of senators like a flexible paper currency, because at the time the country was on the gold standard, which was killing them. Um, and a variety of other really sophisticated reforms. And so I took a huge lesson from those movements, which were very focused on the rules, because they understood that if the rules are rigged to help the rich, um, uh, the rich are going to get helped. You know, and so we need to change the rules to make the playing field a little bit more level. Another critical point of contention at the time, critical protest was against monopoly, which is cropped up again. So just like we don't have the eight hour day anymore, we've got monopolies all over this country. And the issue ju isn't just prices. That's not just, that's not the only problem. It's political power of these gigantic conglomerates. And it's also, um, again, I don't know if there are any chicken farmers in the audience. We have a lot of those, not so much in, Mar in uh, West Virginia, but in Maryland, there's a lot. And you're basically an indentured servant to Tyson or whatever, Tyson, um, and you don't have the opportunity to switch you, you know, he's, Tyson's the only person in the area. And so you, you're, it's practically wage slavery. Yeah. And so, but what distressed me was that these really sophisticated protest movements didn't get anywhere. They didn't get anywhere for 70 years. 
Now, their ideas all got implemented eventually, just about, but not until the period you're talking about. So then my question is, well, what happened? And what I discovered really chilled my blood because what I discovered was we had a bunch of calamities in the early 20th century. We had World War I, the Depression, World War II. That's two global wars. With two Not to mention the 1918 flu pandemic. You know. Exactly. I was getting there. That's exactly <laughs> right. A flu pandemic that dwarfs the current ones. Two world wars with two genocides, the atom bomb, and a global economic meltdown. Now, as we're all experiencing, even though COVID is kind of driving us apart, like tonight, um, we still, I think, have experienced a little bit of the disaster solidarity that crises bring out in people. Like, how many people have you helped that maybe you didn't, like, buy their groceries for them before? Or, you know, how many of you or of us have learned how to sew masks? Or, you know, I mean, just things to help people out. That's what always happens in disaster. Well, by the time you had been through that many disasters, my thesis is that that transformed enough of the population, not everyone, but enough of the population, and especially in the elites. Like, don't let's forget that Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who drove a lot of this changing of the rules to benefit the people, was actually a member of the elite. You know, he could have been one of these kleptocrats. And so, but somehow he was transformed either by, you know, World War I, which he had also lived through, or by his own personal crisis of polio. I don't get into his psychology. I can't, I don't know. But enough people were transfigured by those disasters that it became possible to start changing the rules. Right. Almost, it, it, took, it, it almost took this collective PTSD as a nation yeah, to yeah, yeah. really... Yeah. Which is unfortunate, right? Because you don't want to have to go through some Thank you. cataclysm every time societal changes are needed. But Thank maybe, you. maybe so, is there any, maybe we don't know another way. So that's why I think this is so urgent. That and that's why I'm kind of shouting is because I'm seeing. So the other thing about the Gilded Age, if we want to use that as a parallel, is there was a global, not global. Sorry, there was an economic or financial crash about once every eight or ten years. Seven, seven, 1773, and that means, you know, um, dot com, sorry, uh, savings and loan, dot com, uh, the panics around the world of the late 1990s, 1996 and 1997, in, particularly in Asia and, and South Latin America, and then 2008, and then, you know, not to mention climate and the environmental crisis. I mean, and so it kept happening in the late 19th and early 20th century until really the whole world fell apart a bunch of times. And I'm saying, is that just what you said? Is that what we're going to have to go through? Please. Well, if you, if you look at, if you look at the, if you, if you look at the basic timeline and you kind of overlay them over each other between say the end of World War One, the crash on Wall Street, 1929, and then Pearl Harbor. And you look at the time that's spaced out and you look at 9-11, the Great Recession, and the pandemic we're in here. But I don't think we're there yet. No, that's not where I put it. I put 9-11, that stuff is before you even get to the really serious crashes. Do you see what I mean? Where I would, where I would line us up is we're still in like the 1890s or the 1910s, right? I mean, or not even, we haven't even hit World War I yet. Please, let's mobilize ourselves before we get there. That that's really what the kind of um, urgency, yeah. urgency is. That's exactly right. So you know, I'm curious. You know, you worked in a lot of different places and adjacent to a lot of really powerful people. And 
you know, of course, the most famous quote of all time about corruption, of course, is that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, although I think it began that power tends to corrupt, uh, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, I wonder, do you feel that you can reach the highest levels of government in our system right now, going through the things you have to do, whether it's elections and all the stuff with campaign and the, the money you have to raise from, is it, a, is it, are you able to reach those levels without having been corrupted in some way? Well, that is a great question, Jeff. Um, I think it's really hard. I mean, I think we've seen some examples where people aren't, but in particular, the money primary, the amount of money that you have to raise means almost necessarily that to be a candidate, you sort of have to be in hock to these networks, right? These, these interwoven networks. Um, and that's why I think, you know, selecting candidates who have made a pledge not to accept big money donations is really important, whether it's on the local or the national level. And so I've got an epilogue with a lot of ideas for what to do, both in terms of our lives in the private sector and how we can band together to demand uh, public sector reforms um, the other thing I learned from the protest movements of the 19th and early 20th centuries is, boy, oh boy, everyone was needed. Everyone with all of their talents and all of their foibles and all their weirdnesses and the light behind them that doesn't, you know, that doesn't turn on right, you know, were all needed in an emergency every, you know, and that turns out to be a blessing, not, not like a horrible burden, because there's something for all of us to do. And so, and so, um, so look in that list, you know, and find what suits your talents. But I do think that, you know, demanding change in some of the basic rules of the game of the American political system is absolutely necessary. Money in politics is like a number one because you cannot fully represent your constituents if you have to spend two thirds of your time on the phone to donors, period. It just means that those people get your ear more of the time. So their concerns are being injected into your brain more of the time. And it's just normal that you would start to, I want to say, sympathize to the people you talk to more. And not only that, when they're giving you money, I mean, humans are hardwired to feel gratitude when someone gives you something it's it's a really hard instinct to to um uh counter like you know it gets to a point of the phrase that we heard so much over the last two years which was quid pro quo right think about that concept right yeah yeah no something that's, that's not te something that's not technically illegal right but it's something that was we heard that every day 15 times a day for a year basically you know Right, and it's why the Constitution has an out and out ban on accepting gifts from foreign governments or even subordinate st uh, United States government entities or individuals or their agents. Because the founders, even though they didn't have benefit of the, you know, of the uh, social science that we now have, they um, understood that even without intending to be corrupt, human beings tend to reciprocate when they've been shown generosity. Uh, that's just how we're wired. And so what they very intelligently did was not say, oh, let's wait until after an act has been committed to decide, oh, was there really quid pro quo? And was that really an official act? And did it really match the definition of blah, 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 which is how lawyers can get a lot of people off from, you know, um, Bob McDonnell and former governor of Virginia to Bob Menendez, the senator from New Jersey, right? Um, by getting into the weeds of those little definitions. No, the founders said, you know what? Accepting gifts is likely to lead to some kind of corruption. Therefore, let's head it off at the pass. 
And that's the kind of rules that we need to now reinforce again. We've now discovered that norms don't work, right? When you get somebody in office who just really doesn't give a darn, yeah. um, the norms give way. So we have to turn these into hard-edged law, and that means we, the citizens, have to demand it. It's not going to happen, believe me, unless we really demand it. And there's so many other things we're outraged about. Um, but I kind of feel like this is the source of a lot of the other ills in this country. And then we also have to ask that they be enforced. And so we're in a conversation about law enforcement in this country, right? Yeah. And how it should be resourced. And we're also in a conversation, we've been in a conversation about sentencing in this country and whether nonviolent offenders are being given too much jail time and things like that. And I would just urge us to make some distinctions here. What kind of police, right? The public integrity beat is underfunded. It's underfunded, it's under-resourced, it doesn't have enough um, stature. That needs to be beefed up. What kind of nonviolent offenders? Bob Menendez was a nonviolent offender, but public corruption, corporate crime and corruption delivered, you know, the meltdown in 2008. I mean, look at how many American citizens' lives were destroyed in that event. No one went to jail. So, so let's just bear, let's just, you know, keep our eyes open as we're having this conversation about, about um, law enforcement. You know, that's interesting. You know, I was thinking about, you know, we got to about the 40 minute mark without mentioning Donald Trump, but we'll do it now. But, you know, I, I, when you were talking about campaign finance specifically and kind of how people see that and some of the inherent problems with that, one of the most interesting things about his campaign in 2016 was that whether it ended up being true or not, there was a perception on the part of his voters that he was basically funding his own campaign um, and that he wasn't you know, funded by these people. They thought, hey, he's a rich guy who could basically pay his own way through. And there was something that appealed to him. And I think in some ways it was, it, it touched on the need for no corruption, even though maybe that wasn't the end result, but it touched on something where people thought, this guy can be his own person and he won't be influenced because he's made his own money through whether, who knows, you know, through what process that happened, but the perception was that, and it touched on that thing that you were getting at right there. So there are two ironic points about that. One is we've got a guy who is clearly wasted on the Midas disease. He even wrote a book called The Midas Touch, making out like the Midas Touch was a good thing. <laughs> The whole point of the myth is that the Midas touch is a, is a terrible, terrible life-ending curse, right? So if you've missed the meaning of the myth that badly, um, so that's one thing. So this guy has the Midas disease. The Midas disease means there's no such thing as enough. So I've often heard people say, oh yeah, let's elect a rich person because then, you know, because at least he's got enough, so he's not going to want, he doesn't need anymore. Wrong. This is a race with no finish line. Second, maybe Trump wasn't beholden, and we'll get back to that because he was, but maybe the perception was that he wasn't beholden to other people. What about his self-interest? He was beholden to himself, and therefore he has been hand over fist using his office for personal gain, which is the essence of corruption. Um, now, the fact is, and there's a political scientist called Thomas Ferguson, and I strongly recommend that people take a look at his work, but he does very careful reviews of the data and he gets really into the weeds of the data on campaign financing. Because for example, a lot of people split up their donations and they might like misspell their last name, you know, by a letter, or they might neglect to say where they work, or, you know, they do various things to disguise the fact that it's actually the same person connected to the same institution. What he found was a tsunami of money that started flowing into both Trump and the Senate 
beginning October of 2016. It's really remarkable. And it it really made a difference. So would, would this be what's called dark money or is yeah. this something? I mean, a lot of it is dark and it's dark in a whole bro- he's got another piece of work called Fifty Shades of Green, in which he kind of details the whole range of different vehicles that people can use to disguise their campaign contributions. And all of this, again, is legal. It's another set of rules that we need to change. We need to change why can a nonprofit organization basically be getting a subsidy from U.S. taxpayers to conduct political advocacy? Like, why is that okay? If you're doing political advocacy, it seems to me you shouldn't be nonprofit, whatever side you're doing it for. Mm-hmm. Um, and the problem, I mean, that's another point that I really emphasize and that I feel very strongly about, and it's not very popular right now. This thing crosses the political divide. Americans, as you point out, you know, a lot of people who flock to Trump were moved by his anti-corruption rhetoric, right? Uh, And what's interesting is I've got Trump supporter friends around here. They have 2020 vision when they're looking at corruption, you know, when it's Clinton or Biden. Boy, their eyesight gets poor when they're looking at Trump. And you know what? Democrats are exactly the same. Boy, are we good. Sorry, we are not actually a member of the Democratic Party, but boy, are people who are left-leaning um, good at itemizing all the corruption in the Trump administration. I wrote an article in The Atlantic about, you know what? It is not cool for Hunter Biden to take a job, you know, take a position on a board of directors for which he was completely unqualified of a totally corrupt enterprise in Ukraine when his father is vice president running, you know, Ukraine policy. That is unacceptable. That does not mean that Biden changed U.S. policy as a result. I'm not saying these are the same. However, it's unacceptable. And people who support Vice President Biden have got to be able to recognize that reality or else we're just in for more of the same, where the syndrome is essentially shared across political parties, which is what I found in the Gilded Age. And I found that back then it was shared across political parties and even across political systems. So no party is immune, no political system is immune. We have to write the rules. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because one of the things, you know, you talked when we were defining corruption at the beginning of this conversation, you talked about the public trust, right? Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's not necessarily whether it's good or bad. In some ways, the perception is more important than anything else. If you lose the trust, you know, trust is a concept, right? Um, If you lose the trust or the perception of a um, corrupted person or someone who's been compromised there, then you are already kind of two steps back in the process, right? So whether someone was influenced and they did the act because of that or a quid pro quo took place or did not, once it's kind of been breached, you've you've kind of gone over that line, that's where the trouble seems to begin and the trust starts to erode. Yeah, and especially if you're seen to not be upholding the same standards that you're demanding of the other side. That's what really troubles me is that then corruption becomes a partisan issue and only the other side can ever be corrupt. So there's another sacred story that I um, bring in early and late, and it's an even more famous one than Midas. It's Jesus. So there are two, four lines of gospel that are unbelievably dramatic if you really think about it. And it's when Jesus strides up the steps. It's actually the climactic event in his ministry. He strides up the steps of the temple and he commits what for him is a really violent act. I mean, he makes a whip of cords. He starts, you know, scattering all of the sacrificial animals and he he overturns the tables of the money changers. Now, it's an incredibly powerful moment, and, and, and what I did with that, just like with Midas, was look at the history and the archaeology. 
and it's incredibly revealing. The temple, I had no idea. The temple was the most magnificent building complex east of Rome. It looked a little bit like Trump Tower. It was gold-plated. It had the high court there. The Supreme Court was there. It was basically Washington, Wall Street, Fort Knox, and the military base in Qatar or something like that. It wasn't, you know. All combined. Yeah. All combined. That's what Jesus took on. What's fascinating is that he didn't do it alone. He did it surrounded by people. And what people? All the people. First, he said, love thy neighbor. First, he bound the community together across its identity divides. So this was not a faction that was going after the money changer, changers. First, he healed the factions. He said, the factions are killing us. We have to be united here. And he, he kind of welded that group together with shared food, which is how humans have become egalitarian for you know tens of thousands of years is sharing food, the loaves and the fishes, right? So it was surrounded by that group of people that, and, and what he does is he, so he strides up the steps of the temple, and it, I mean, it, for him it was violent, but it's not like he killed anybody. He shamed them. He put them to shame. How dare you? turn our most sacred values, that is the temple, into gold, into zeros in bank accounts. Shame on you. So shocked and horrified was the kleptocratic network, if you excuse my using of the same, you know, vocabulary, that that was the moment they decided they had to kill him. That was what did it. And then they couldn't do it because he was surrounded by this coalition. So I emphasize that because as I've looked at anti-corruption protests around the world, you know, the networks, these corrupt networks don't take it lying down, right? <laughs> you know, they don't just sit there when they have opposition. They have a lot of tactics and counter moves, right? The most effective one is to divide up the victims of their rule rewriting to divide up the people suffering the wealth divide or suffering the terrible working conditions or being you know evicted from their homes divide them up along identity divides in lebanon it was you know the sects look at the calamity that it took in lebanon for the people to finally come together and get rid of this this network, right? I mean, a real calamity on top of calamity. Um, in Bosnia, it was quote unquote ethnic groups. In the United States, golly gee, I mean, it's gender, it's race, it's, uh, we don't even say race anymore, we say color. It's sort of black, black and brown versus white. Identity, identity politics. Identity right. politics and this kind of uber identity politics, which is political party. Because that's another really interesting thing, is our political parties increasingly are gathering together other elements of our identities. Not quite as much as we think. I know a lot of people who eat organic, you know, and are very conservative. So, um, uh, it culturally, it's not quite as uniform as I think the caricature would have it. But still... We are collapsing a lot of our different identities under these political banners. Now, so long as we only see corruption in the other identity group, be it political or race or gender, it's not going to work. It's gonna, we're going to descend into factionalism, which we have. And boy, corrupt networks love that. It's yeah. great for them. We'll keep losing. Uh, my last question, and uh, you know, we could talk for a long time. It's really been a pleasure speaking with you tonight. But uh, my last question would be this: you know, I'm, I'm very much a uh, short-term pessimist, but a long-term optimist. Um, I'm curious, you know, if you see anything that kind of gives you some glimmer of hope, and you know, in the coming years, um, that would give you any sense of 
some positive movement to kind of deal with some of these issues. Obviously, you have kind of a citizen's guide to fixing some of these problems in the book, and that's on a kind of an individual level, of course, and that's where we have to start. But, you know, talk about some things that you feel like might be moving in the right direction. I mean, it's a tough one. I do think that the issue is way more public than it was when I started working on it. One of the reasons I didn't go heavier on corruption at home in my last book, Thieves of State, is because I thought already what I had to say, that violent religious extremism had more to do with corruption than it had to do with religion, was so, uh, I want to say, provocative that I felt like I couldn't freight that book any more with another provocative thing, which was, guess what, guys? The United States of America is on this continuum. Now we're all saying it. But still, I mean... I don't see serious anti-corruption. I mean, there was a pretty, a couple of pretty interesting House and Senate bills, particularly on the Democratic side, that had some pretty important um, uh, elements in there. So legislation is underway. There are movements and things like that. But I, I think it's going to take a very concerted push by the public. I don't frankly think that Biden or Harris are real champions of anti-corruption. I don't think you can find in their past where they have taken remarkable stances against this business model, either of them. That means that should they be elected, um, they're still going to need a lot of work. I don't believe that President Trump is going to turn over a new leaf. So if he gets reelected, we're in trouble, in my view. Um, but a Democratic, I want to say, uh, president is no guarantee. And that's so I don't have a really optimistic outlook. There's another issue that the 19th century didn't have as badly. And that's the environment. We're running out of time, guys. We don't have 70 years to mess around and get this wrong. We're on a much quicker ticking clock. And it's not just CO2 in the environment. It's habitat collapse. It's species extinction. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an incredible moment because just as we're really teetering on the edge of a sort of no return, at least in terms of our own species, it's the same moment when we're in a, almost a Copernican revolution, discovering that our brain-based intelligence may in fact not be the most sophisticated intelligence out there, and that, golly gee, trees communicate. And they communicate through networks of mush, you know, mushrooms, basically, underground. Wow, prairie dogs can distinguish not only among humans, but like the human that was carrying a gun last time, they still recognize that that's the same human even if he doesn't have a gun this time. I mean, it is unbelievable. We are about to be dethroned from our position in the center of the living world as the most intelligent one. Just And at the very same moment, our so-called intelligence is sending this finite, miraculous world to the brink of ruin. That's what's at play here, guys. I don't want to sound too much like a Cassandra, but this is really serious. And so I want to say that in a way, optimism and pessimism isn't almost relevant. We yeah. just have to be determined. Like, we can't lose this. It's not an option. Yeah. Yeah, realism is important, definitely. Well, it's um, determination, right? So it's not even that continuum. It's something else entirely, which is we're not going to permit this to happen. <laughs> and that means it takes all of us. Yeah, and then, you know, and that's where I think we can find some silver lining in the fact of, you know, I know, and we have to look to the past, right? That's the only, it's the only, it's the only prologue we have that, humans do have the will and capacity to do the things. The question is, will we do them? But we certainly do have the will and capacity to do them. Absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. So it's up well, to us. Yeah, well, I wanna say a big, big thank you. This was a really fascinating conversation. And uh, 
for those of you watching, I hope you will get a copy of this wonderful book. It's really, we barely just kind of touched uh, on a lot of the issues. There's a lot of stuff here to think about and uh, to, you know, to get going and, and, and take some action in your own life and, and uh, do the work that needs to be done. But I want to say a big thank you to Sarah for joining us uh, all the way from West Virginia. And uh, we hope you guys will all stay safe, uh, read more, and we look forward to seeing you very soon again. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks to all of you and thanks to Magic Books. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Buy, buy your books from little bookstores like Magic Books. That's <laughs> one of the recommendations. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. See you guys later. Bye-bye.